Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Christensen and this is Horror 101 with Dr. AC, a gathering place for fellow fiends the world over to discuss all things freaky and frightening. If you want to be part of the conversation, and I hope you do, I invite you to like this video, subscribe to the channel, maybe go back, check out some of our previous episodes, leave a comment, and most importantly, let us know the fright flicks you'd like to discuss in the future. That kind of connection is exactly what we're looking for, and it really does make a difference. We're all about sharing the scare, and we want to hear from you. If you're a fan of Italian horror cinema, it's likely that the names of Mario Bava, Dario Argento, Lucio Fulci, Umberto Lenzi, Michele Suave, Lamberto Bava, Joe D'Amato, and Rogero Deodato roll off the tongue as easily as ordering bruschetta at your local ristorante. But one name that continues to labor for recognition is Antonio Margareti, in some respects due to the fact that he was often billed by his anglicized moniker, Anthony M. Dawson. Like his contemporaries, Margarete made a tremendous assortment of films, from westerns to comedies to sci-fi, and dabbled in numerous horror subgenres, from atmospheric ghost stories to gory splatterfests and everything in between, delivering exciting and entertaining features for nearly four decades. Tonight, we celebrate his two 1964 black-and-white gothic masterpieces, Castle of Blood and The Long Hair of Death, both celebrating their 60th anniversary and both starring the unforgettable Barbara Steele. You might want to get out your notebooks because we're about to add a few more names and titles to your viewing list as we honor the one and only Antonio Margarete. I'm very excited to chat about this double feature of Antonio Margariti and Barbara Steele. So let's bring everybody in and let's say hello to... John Kitley of Kitley's Crypt. Hello, hello. Author Troy Howarth. Hello. And the maestro of the Giallo Room, Brian Martinez. Oh, hi. And we are here to chat about Castle Blood from 1964 and The Long Hair of Death, also from 1964, both celebrating fantastic anniversaries this year. Thanks for coming on the show, everybody, and welcome. So I was saying backstage that uh, the reason this uh, panel came to be is that I was sitting watching uh, a special feature on a little film called Alien from the Abyss, which was directed by Antonio Margheriti. And uh, there was a little featurette on there uh, talking about, uh, you know, some of Margheriti's work. And I realized, oh, my gosh, Castle of Blood and Long Hair of Death are both having anniversaries this year. I got to get my favorite Italian loving folks together so we can chat about them. So when we hear about, you know, people we never hear about, we often hear about people like, you know, Umberto Lenzi, Sergio Martino, but I feel like not enough love is given to Antonia Margariti. And so I thought this would be a great opportunity for us to chat about them. Brian Martinez already has a question. Well, I thought we were talking about Anthony Dawson. Oh, sure. Um, Let's talk about him too. Anthony M. Dawson, Brian? Jeez, come on, get it right. Thanks, Troy. <laughs> so I'm curious, uh, because these are two like really great examples of the gothic cinema, uh, clearly inspired by Black Sunday, uh, the success of Black Sunday, directed by Mario Bava. But I'm going to bounce down to you, Troy, just because you haven't piped up already like these other rudniks. Uh, and what was your first experience with Antonio Margariti, a.k.a. Anthony M. Dawson? That's a good question. I think, um, the well, the first film I would have seen that he had a hand in, although for years it was a little bit misunderstood in terms of how much of a hand he had, and it was a movie called Flesh for Frankenstein, uh, ah. also known as Andy Warhol's Frankenstein, uh, which he did do second unit directing on. Um, on the Italian prints... And the Italian advertising, he's listed as the director. Uh, that's that's just for quota purposes because it was an Italian-American co-production. Carlo Ponti and Andy Warhol, right. uh, a match made in heaven, uh, produced this film. It was really the work of Paul Morrissey. And uh, fortunately, the, the information has been corrected in more recent years. But for years, a lot of people said, oh, it's such, so strange that... Uh, this this man who directed black and white gothic movies like Castle of Blood, which I'd never seen at that time, would direct this kind of sleazy, um, gory 1970s uh, sort of take on Frankenstein. So he did have a hand in that. Um, I suppose the first movie of his that I saw that he 
directed was probably Seven Deaths in a Cat's Eye, mm. um, a Jallo he did in 73, which I'm very fond of. It's not a great film, but it's it's a lot of fun. It's very stylishly shot. And, uh, you know, it's a fun kind of fusion of gothic and Jallo with uh, a guy in a really bad gorilla costume <laughs> and um, mad scientists. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's a weird one in the sense it's it's kind of a throwback. But at the same time, it's it's embracing the Jallo boom of the early 1970s. So I think that was my first uh, real introduction. How about you, John? Probably Killer Fish on TV. I'm not sure when it played on TV when I saw it. it came out in 79, but it's probably early 80s. And I uh, had no idea who the director was, who even Antonio Margheriti was. <clears throat> but looking at his credit, at his credit, that's probably the first one that I could see because that was done probably even before the VHS, or at least in my getting a, a, v, a VCR and all that stuff. So it was probably Killer Fish. Which and I Brian? still like as cheesy as it oh, is. Oh, no. Killer Fish is great fun. <laughs> and Brian? Uh, first of all, it's Antonio Magaretti. Thank Magaretti. you. It's from. You ever watch uh, Inglorious Bastards? They're like trying to pass off as Italians. And uh, I think it's um, uh, Eli Roth's character. They ask him to like pronounce his name with like a little bit of music or whatever. He's like, Magaretti. It's, uh, it's funny. But no, um, Seven Deaths in a Cat's Eye. Uh, would be my intro to the maestro. The first I saw of his would have Killer Fish came hard upon it, but it was actually the remake of Castle of Blood, Web of the Spider, and starred uh, our our hero from Tenebrae, Anthony Franciosa, and Klaus Kinski. Mm -hmm. And then I went back and saw Castle of Blood and went, wait, it's the same story. Only, only a little better, I think. Uh, I'm a well, big that's, that's fan why, of gothic look. That's why he did it, right? Like he he thought the the original one was boring, um, so he he like remade his own movie to. Throw well, he he changed he changed that story at numerous times. He later said he <laughs> never should have done it. Uh, he said he yeah. should never have remade it. But he did for a long time dismiss Castle of Blood <laughs> as being kind of an antique, in the same way that Jess right. Franco used to talk about Doctor Orloff. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest reason why I did it again was because the Castle Blood wasn't very successful at the box office. And hmm. uh, there was kind of a thought, though, maybe if they'd have done it in color. So 1970 rolls around. They said, oh, let's dust that off and we'll do it again. We'll do it in color and see how it floats. And yeah, it didn't go so great. <laughs> and like a lot of Italian directors, well, like a lot of Italian directors, he changes his story from, you know, depending on yeah. interview to interview, but he covered a lot of different genres. He did a lot of Westerns with Lee Van Cleef, Sword and Sandal movies, uh, and he did a lot of sci-fi stuff as well. And then he did Cannibal Apocalypse, which was definitely one that uh, felt kind of out of character for him. But I think he does a really, it's a fun, it's a fun film to watch if you're into kind of Italian gore and, and splatter. But let us, let us dive into our first show of the evening, The Long Hair of Death. Actually, let's, let's do the other one first. Let's go into oh Castle of Blood, oh. 1964. Let me change my notes here. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, because I think it is a really great kind of haunted house movie. There's also mm. really terrific <clears throat> mystery to it. And spoilers, there's vampires or something like, you know, blood drinking ghosts. Uh, I really, I really dug kind of like all the left turns that kept coming. Plus we have Barbara Steele. And for folks who don't know who Barbara Steele is, uh, she was an English actress who became quite a sensation thanks to Mario Baba's Black Sunday in 1960. And she did eight films or at least had eight films released in 1964, anybody want to talk to talk about? I'd love to talk to Barbara Steele. Uh, mm. Would anybody like to talk about Barbara Steele and perhaps the first time they encountered her? Well, I've I've actually spoken to her, so I guess I can talk a little bit about her. She's an English actress, as you mentioned. She got her start in the late 50s in British films. Um, you'll see her in very small parts in some interesting films from the late 50s, including a murder mystery kind of a progressive murder mystery from the late 50s directed by Basil Deard in a movie called Sapphire, mm. which kind of deals with uh, racism, uh, deals with the, the murder of a, of, of a young black person. And, uh, you know, it kind of gets into 
the sort of racial tension of the period, which was uh, was pretty progressive for the period. Um, she has a small part in it. She didn't really do anything particularly big. She got an offer to come out to Hollywood and went out to Hollywood and was uh, doing sort of screen tests and makeup tests and hair tests for a movie directed by Don Siegel and starring Elvis, of yep. all people, uh, Flaming Star. It was a Western. And uh, there are some pictures of her with um, either a wig or I think it was probably a wig. I doubt she would have dyed her hair blonde. And she, she just didn't like the part. She didn't like the fact that they wanted to change her look. And so she just, she left. She basically left. She really kind of burned her bridges as far as that was concerned. You know, you just don't walk out on a film like that, especially at the beginning of your career. You, you haven't earned the right to be a diva yet. Uh, <laughs> so she decides to go to Italy pretty much for the express purpose of working with Fellini. Mm -hmm. For years, that was all she wanted to talk about. She did not want to talk about these movies at all. Um, she was quite dismissive of them. She was very, um, I think it's safe to say that she was young. She was having a good time. She wasn't really taking them very seriously. And, uh, you know, for years, she wouldn't even really talk about them. It's more recently she's changed, re realized she can make some money off of it, I think. Um, so she's she's embraced it now. But she tells a lot of stories that are, yeah, you know, they're a little, little suspect. She had this run of low-budget horror films, which... Uh, you know, at the time, like I said, she wasn't taking them seriously. She had no idea who these people were. Mario Bava was uh, the director of her first Italian film, and it was his first official film as a director. Right. So he certainly wasn't, you know, famous. He wasn't Fellini. And after that, she's working with people like Riccardo Freda and Antonio Margheriti and Camilo Castrocinque and Massimo Pupillo. Not major big directors, but it, you know, often very talented directors who are doing these really interesting gothic horror films. But she does end up working with Fellini. Um, she does end up appearing in Eight and a Half, which, of course, is, is one of the great masterpieces of world cinema. She actually worked with him again on Casanova later on, but her role ended up getting cut because there was a lot of sort of terrorist activity that was going on in Italy at the end of the 1970s. And that was one of many unlucky productions where, like, canisters of film were kidnapped, uh, basically by thieves. And uh, they would contact the producers and say, if you want your movie back, you're going to pay us this much money. <laughs> Yep. And a lot of the producers would tell them what they could go do with themselves. So that that never happened. Uh, that footage was never recovered in time. Um, so she did get to realize her ambition uh, of working with Fellini. But, you know, she also she even worked with Lucio Fulci. Well, before Lucio Fulci was known for horror films, she did an anthology comedy film with him called The Maniacs. Mm -hmm. Um, she doesn't remember, <laughs> you know, she doesn't remember a lot of these people, quite frankly, because they were short, they were short schedules. They, they weren't, you know, they weren't something that she was particularly super passionate about. They were just jobs, but she had this very unusual quality. She's a very beautiful woman, but she was somebody who has this sort of, it's, it's kind of like a Charles Adams kind of quality to her. There's just something about her, her high forehead and her big eyes um, it just makes her kind of an unusual presence that can lend itself either to playing villainous characters mm -hmm. or sympathetic characters or characters who are very ambiguous. And not surprisingly, the directors who work the best with her in terms of getting the best results were the ones who knew how to use this quality very effectively. Bava knew how to do it. Freda knew how to do it. And I think Margariti did too. Uh, and when it comes to her relationship with these directors, you know, Freda was known for being a tyrant, a um, bit of a bully, very, you know, autocratic and dictatorial on the set. Bava was very quiet, very shy, very reserved. And Margariti was was closer to a Bava type temperament. Um, so she got along with him just fine. Most people who worked with Margariti actually spoke very well of him. So she does these two films with him um, in relatively short succession and has a good time working with them, but those are the only two that they do together. Yep. Uh, John, what are your thoughts on Barbara Steele? She's always, she's always entertaining to be on screen. Um, she is kind of like Troy mentioned. She's for me, she's one of those actresses that in certain moments she can just look stunning. And another time she just looks a bit odd, a bit strange. And that's all with her features that, that Troy mentioned, but I've always, I mean, she hasn't done a ton of, in the horror genre, but the stuff that she has been in, and I've actually preferred 
the black and white stuff that she's done, like the two we're covering in Black Sunday. But going to color, like in Corman's uh, Fit in the Pendulum, yeah, she does an, an exceptional job there as well. And Brian, I feel like a schlub talking to like these scholars of it. <laughs> <laughs> they like just whip out all these amazing uh, factoids and whatnot. But no, I just, I've always just like, I've been so intrigued by her look, uh, you know, much like you, you gentlemen have said already. Um, she just has this like air of goth to her, like those black hair. Like I've always been attracted to like, you know, black haired beauties in all of the films that I've seen, um, you know, and then like I watched her in uh, Baba's films and I was just like, wow, she's something about it that's just so memorable whenever she's just on screen like 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 john was saying like she looks she has that air of oddness to her but like very striking very beautiful i think i said this in a previous podcast show uh where like i just wish she was in much more mm -hmm. stuff you know like she just has that face and you know oftentimes she's really dramatic in her roles or whatever um but it, like it just fits so well in these in these particular films and then just like that distinct personality, like I, I just think that if she was in much bigger films, like I, I even, I had this discussion with somebody who asked me um, online, like uh, if, if I could interchange her in another role that, you know, is is more well-known or whatever, she, I think she would be great in Suspiria, you know, just because she's got those eyes and that just like really dramatic personality and the love witch like you know it, the love witch isn't really a big film that i love or whatever but like i i could see her in something like that like bring in that that witchiness and stuff into that role like i, I just think it would have served her really well had she been in a lot more pictures and i was i was also fortunate enough to meet her i was at the brussels international film festival as you pointed out troy and i think very astutely she could play either side of the good bad she could be a wonderful villain she could be a, and she does so she does play both of those roles in black sunday and we also see her kind of do that in long hair of death uh she kind of plays a a victim who then turns out to be a little more sinister. Well, the, it's a Black Sunday. It's the Madonna and the whore in in uh, Long Hair of Death. It's uh, very much the, um, uh, the the victim and the Avenger. Um, so she's getting to do both sides of that. Um, actually, my my favorites of her Italian films, uh, I would I would say, are the two she did with Freda. Um, I think especially the Ghost in terms of her performances. That's a really strong performance from her. Um, she doesn't have such a great part in Dr. Hitchcock. As a matter of fact, I've, I've said before, I think that they missed a trick there by not casting her in a dual role once again. Mm. Uh, she could have played the um, the wife uh, that's dead. Um, that that is, is a big part of the plot, as well as the new bride. Uh, but hey, you can't have everything. Well, and John pointed out my my introduction to her was also Pit in the Pendulum, mm -hmm. because I remember the ending of that movie just freaking me out as a kid and i won't spoil it for anybody but like the end of that movie is dark uh, well and funnily enough that's a that's an american film but she's dubbed there again um right. and there are conflicting stories about that some people said that corman thought that her british accent clashed with everybody else uh <laughs> and other other people indicated that it was probably more likely that there were just some production audio issues and she was already back in italy by the time so they figured well nobody knows what she sounds like anyway so it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, I would say if, if they were that concerned about accents, they, they wouldn't have hired people like Anthony Carbone and Luana Anders in that film who are, who are just so right. incredibly American uh, for this uh, Spanish set uh, period piece. But it's OK. It's all right. It's all part of the charm. So let's dive into Castle of Blood. Uh, it begins with a reporter, a journalist uh, who is he takes a bet with Edgar Allan Poe and uh, the owner of uh, the, the castle that bets him he cannot stay the entire night. Uh, if he does, he'll get uh, he'll get $100. <laughs> and, uh, and because he's, you know, a little down on his luck, he says, you know what, I'll wager, what does he say, like 5 or $10? Bucks. Yeah. But then, uh, but he goes there and goes inside and he meets the what we presume is a ghost or is it? And, uh, and that character is played by Barbara Steele. What I love about this movie is it does just kind of take us into 
other dimensions. There's times where we're looking at the past as though it's happening right in front of us. I think it's a really interesting uh, narrative, and I love how it kind of plays with our our dream logic. I just love this film because of the the black and white, the cinematography. Um, <clears throat> it's one of those films that I would definitely bring up to prove a point on people that don't think that black and white films are colorful. Mm. And I, and I think the use of the use of shadows and, and everything in here is just stunning. And that 4k release from Severin is unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth pointing out that the other name or the Italian name for castle blood is Donza Macabra, which is the name of the box set. And then the second box set is the one that Donza Macabre is actually on. But that just came out from Severn and absolutely well worth checking out. It's got a ton of extras. Troy, you were talking backstage. Uh, tell us some of the extras that are on that that new release from Severn. Uh, I think, the for me anyway, the one of the most substantial and interesting extras is the commentary by Rod Barnett of the Nashi cast and Adrian Smith who is a big uh, kind of booster of all things Margariti. Ah. Um, so, you know, they, they're obviously in very comfortable terrain there and they, uh, uh, they do a very good job talking about the film. There's, there's another uh, piece that's advertised as a partial commentary by Barbara Steele and her archivist, Russ uh, Lanier. Um, it's, it's really more of an audio interview, quite frankly. I, yeah. I don't know why they advertise it that way. It's sort of a strange choice. Um, but there's uh, some other featurettes, interviews, and, and so forth included as well. So it's uh, pretty much, I would think it's likely to remain the definitive release of this film. Certainly as far as the transfer goes, I mean, this 4K is a, a, a huge step up because the previous version that Severin had put out as an extra on the um, Blu-ray of Nightmare Castle, which mm. is a slightly later Barbara Steele Gothic by Mario Cayano. Um, that was taken from really kind of battered, uh, 35 millimeter print, you know, so this is, this is all cleaned up and pristine and, uh, uncut. And yeah, I mean, you've got the Italian version as well as the English version. Brian Martinez, you've seen this film before, right? No, actually, um, the only film that I've watched before is Long Hair of Death out of these two, but, um, you know, I'm not going to be like the one to like, th this one really was, um, a bit of a chore for me to sit through. Um, highlighted by my dog howling in yes. during the opening credits of this movie. <laughs> for whatever reason, the, um, uh, what, what is it, Ritz or Ortolani? Um, the soundtrack, like for whatever reason, he just started, like like I'm over there watching it, I'm like, oh cool. And then I, I hear the the howling, which I thought was part of the, the, the soundtrack. And it turns <laughs> out that it's my dog Maximus. <laughs> So um, it, it was interesting in that regard, but um, I don't know, like if, if we're like zipping through the movie in terms of spoilers or whatever, uh, just the way that he gets it at the end for me, like it's it just like, it was kind of ridiculous. Like it, 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 I literally laughed out loud when I saw that happen. Um, but like, I, I enjoy the, the gothiness of this movie, I, um, which I actually like a little bit better in Long Hair of Death. The gentleman that plays Alan Foster, yes. uh, Georges Riviera. George Riviera, I believe. <laughs> yeah. um, he's going to be 100 in J July. Like he's still, he's still kicking. He's still around. So July yeah. 1st, he's going to be 100 years old, which is crazy. There you go. Yeah. yeah. He actually went on after this. He did Marguerite's second uh, Gothic, although it came out first, Virgin of Nuremberg or Horror mm -hmm. Castle, which uh, also has a resort to landing score and also features Christopher Lee in a, uh, in a significant role. So... Yeah, there you go. The the year of Riviera. Uh, John, tell us a little bit about what you love about Castle of Blood. I, I like the whole gothic element. I like the fact that this house is kind of a sponge of either ghosts or souls or whatever. People that go there, you're going to see a replay of these characters of how they ended up there. And then you will be there at the end yourself yeah. so it doesn't I, I wouldn't say that it has a very strong story angle going through it's just this guy gets almost suckered into this bat and witnesses these ghosts and then all of a sudden he as he's trying to escape becomes one himself um i think it's it's pretty good like i said it's not a traditional ghost story where you always have that puzzle you have to solve and everything's going to 
come to a close at the end. But I, I myself thought the gate thing was kind of cool because <laughs> he's just outside and you're like, oh, okay, he got free and then slam. Yep. And I did love it when the, the Lord or whomever the owner of the castle shows up and collects his debt. Yeah. Takes his money. Yeah. That's I thought great. that was hilarious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he just like reaches in his pocket. <laughs> and Ed ground Poe's like, yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Like the, the guy that's, uh, you know, uh, steering the, the horse and buggy, he, you know, he's, Oh, there's another, <laughs> another dead <laughs> guy tacked to the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Troy, any thoughts on uh, Castle Blood? I think, you know, any any kind of discussion of plot or narrative to me in a film like this is almost kind of beside the point. It, it's the mood. It's the atmosphere. It's kind of typical. And I think Western culture in particular, we have this, um, we, we want to read film as like literature. And so mm -hmm. it's all based on, does it have a good, strong story? Does it have good characters? Is it you know, to have the three act and does everything pay off? And it's like, eh, you know, I mean, that's fine, but that's not what all these films necessarily go for. And one of the things I find really interesting in general about the Italian approach, and it's the reason why it's very difficult uh, for a lot of people, especially, you know, you think about the Giallo, for example, people were into really kind of traditional, classical Agatha Christie kind of murder mysteries. They don't like these movies. They don't like them because they don't always play fair. Um, they introduce elements that are just there for the sake of being weird. And they're like, well, what the hell was the point? That's, that's, that's the point. Is that <laughs> Threw you off guard, didn't it? Throws you off guard. It creates something weird. So it's the same thing with these gothic films. It's, you know, I don't know that any of them really have like great stories. I mean, is Black Sunday such a phenomenal story? I don't really think it is. But it's the atmosphere that's conjured up. And that's what works really well here. Uh, Margariti. Uh, is is working with the same cinematographer on these two films, Ricardo Palatini, um, who does a sensational job uh, working with this, uh, you know, with with these standing sets. Which I should we should mention, the whole reason that this movie exists is because of the sets that Ottavio Scotti um, had built for a movie called The Monk of Monza, which was a comedy uh, starring the Neapolitan comic Toto. Uh -huh. Not to be confused with the group, but uh, the, the comic. <laughs> or Total. the old dog from Wizard of Oz. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, that had been directed by Sergio, Sergio Corbucci, who later became famous for doing Django and uh, Companeros, The Great Silence, you know, things like that. And he uh, was tasked by the producer, well, we've got these great sets. Let's make another movie on them. Let's write something that so they basically threw together a story to take advantage of these sets. That's that's how it came together. But Corbucci ended up getting busy on something else. So Margariti took over. Although Corbucci did direct part of the movie at the very end, he came in to do like some second unit stuff while Margariti was busy because this whole thing was shot in like 15 days. Right. Can you believe that looking at it, it's just so gorgeous. It's just beautifully filmed. But that wasn't atypical. A lot of the Bava films were shot super quick. The Corman films were shot super quick. You know, Mask of the Red Death was, was shot in like 15 days as well. That just blows my mind. But I mean, when you had great cinematographers and set designers and everybody uh, on these films, you could get really rich looking results. So that's what I love about this movie. It's just the mood. It's the atmosphere. If you're used to a, a quicker pace or to a lot of action, yeah, it probably drags a bit. Honestly, it, it is a lot of, uh, you know, George Riviere walking around and wandering from room to room and, yeah, I mean, some there are films I can think of, like um, The Return of Count Yorga, for example, which could have benefited by cutting out like 10 minutes of that. Mm. You know, I, I don't need all these scenes of people opening doors, looking, going inside. Come on, pick it up. But in this case, I don't know. It just doesn't bother me. So it's it's the mood. Well, I, think, it's the I think the candelabra helps, like when he's walking around with the candelabra. You know? There you go. There you go. I've got those, one of those myself. Those always help, no matter exactly. what. <laughs> John and I were on a previous podcast talking about the terror of uh, mm -hmm. Roger Corman production. It's and, all walking down corridors. And, and it's all because of you know, existing, existing sets and mm -hmm. a storyline that makes no sense at all because you're kind no. of making it up as they went along. I will say, much like the terror, one of the things I do like about this movie, in addition to its great atmosphere, is how wackadoo the narrative is. You know, hard left turns uh, almost every 20 minutes. You're like, wait, who are you again? Wait, where'd that character come from? Oh, and there's a there's a guy with a, no shirt on with bulging muscles coming in. Through the, <laughs> like, what, what is happening? Well, I mean, if we're going to talk about the supporting cast too, there's a couple other important connections here. Uh, we've talked about Black Sunday. 
Arturo Domenici, who plays Yuvutic in, in Black Sunday, he plays uh, Dr. Karmas in this film. And what a wonderful actor he was. I When people talk about Black Sunday and they always go on about Barbara Still, I'm like, yeah, but Arturo Domenici, he kind of steals that movie, I think. He's great. He's really scary. Um, and he's very effective here. Um, Savannah Tranquilli, who plays uh, Poe in this film, he mm -hmm. comes back in Web of the Spider, uh, playing a completely different character. But he'd already been opposite Barbara Steele in the uh, horrible Dr. Hitchcock. And, uh, you know, Umberto Rajo, uh, the guy who plays Lord Blackwood, he's the one who puts, uh, puts the guy up to the bed. Um, not only does he come back for the long hair of death, but uh, he'd been opposite Barbara Steele in The Ghost. And, uh, he plays uh, Alberto Ranieri, the art uh, gallery owner in Bird with the Crystal Plumage, amongst other films. So another okay. familiar face. Was that going to be your connection, Brian? Um, no, actually. Um, oh, good. Uh, well, then we have we have another connection. <laughs> well, because uh, Troy, you know, Troy is a Jalo scholar himself, so I just want to also mention that uh, Silvano Tra Tranquilli. Um, mm -hmm. He's also in So Sweet. So Dead, which is, um, you know, sort of a, a play on the title of your masterful book series. They stole it from me. They, they, exactly. <laughs> I was going to say. How rude. Um, Bloodsta <laughs> he was also in Bloodstained Butterfly um, yeah. and Black, Be Black Belly of Death. Uh, yeah, Black yeah, one Belly of my favorites. Of so, um, so, and then uh, you kind of stole my thunder in terms of, uh, you know, revealing that Umberto Raja is also in Long Hair of Death. But I was just going to mention, there's another movie uh, that you know. Seeing that we have Troy here, I was I was going to ask because um, he wrote that amazing Argento book. If he got the a chance to ask, or you know, maybe get the inside <laughs> inside knowledge or whatever. But there's a there's a scene in this witch movie, right? This long hair of death movie. It's a witch movie, and there's a scene of a girl turning a a flower in order to reveal a. a a hidden door right? hmm. so, so i was like i wonder you know sitting there watching that i was like i wonder if argento just was like hmm, let me grab that and put it here you know with the iris you know um, my my suspicion is that he he definitely subconsciously remembered that yeah um, because he was a film critic at the time uh and he i'm sure he would have would have seen it i mean he was watching everything that was coming out like so. he'll probably never admit it right <laughs> no well he may not even remember to be fair to him he may not even True. remember where he True. got it from but i'll guarantee you yeah in the back of his mind he was like well mm -hmm. that's a pretty good idea let's take it yeah that's right, what, right. it's that's how that's what filmmakers do they're all magpies <laughs> And Long Hair of Death is, as you said, Brian, it's, it's a witch movie. It starts off with um, Barbara Steele's character's mother being burned at the stake and her giving her body to the Lord of the Manor in, in exchange for him saving her mother. But of course, he passes out after he ravishes her <laughs> and <bastard>. doesn't <laughs> go save mom. And so the curse is levied upon the Lord and his son. And uh, that's where the movie kind of picks up is that we have Kurt, you know, takes it upon himself that he is going to marry the youngest daughter of the supposed witch and against her will. And then one day, a character who looks suspiciously like the eldest daughter, played by Barbara Steele, comes back into the picture. And it's once again, Barbara Steele playing a dual character. What are people's thoughts on long hair of death? Kurt is such a douchebag. Like, <laughs> it's one, <laughs> like if I could just say Oh, that. we got that into the record. <laughs> it, it's, oh, there it's goes one my of those, whole monologue. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those movies where it's like, you're, you're waiting for him to get his, his just <laughs> uh, vengeance or whatever. But like it, during this entire film, it's like he, like, okay. The, the one detail where he forces the, the one girl to get married to him. Yeah. And then like says, like basically says, Oh, I hate you for marrying me or whatever. It's like, dude, you're the one that, fucking, <laughs> you know, but yeah, like I, I just, uh, this movie, like in terms of just atmosphere and the vibe of this film, I love witch stuff. I love Gothic stuff mixed with witchcraft stuff. And like, it's just, and it's shot beautifully. There's, there's so many versions of this, but if you watch the Italian version, which I'm not sure if like either or, right? Like, but this, the Italian version just looks so crisp. It's so like beautifully, um, you could see the the beautifully shot film for what it is and all its glory and whatnot. And and then like the, the soundtrack too, like the soundtrack, which kind of carries on throughout the entire film. Like it just adds to that, that air of witchiness. Um, I just love this movie. So. John, how about you? When did you see Long Hair Death for the first time? 
It had to have been back in the in the bootleg days. I do remember in uh, Phil Hardy's Encyclopedia of Horror, there's a photo of Barbara Steele standing next to the the effigy at the end of the movie. And it's one of those things that as you're getting into these things, and you know who Barbara Steele is because mm-hmm. obviously Black Sunday, here's another film. It sounded cool. So then that begins that eternal quest to try to find it. And I've always liked this film. I It's one of my favorite Italian soundtracks from that era, mm. this and Nightmare Castle. To Troy's point, as far as the plot, there's a lot of stuff where you, if you want to sit there and pick nitpick, you're going, wait a minute, mm. what? She killed, he killed your mom. You're going to, you're marrying him and now you want to be his. So there's a lot of stuff where you're going, okay, this makes no bullshit sense. <laughs> but I love the atmosphere when yeah. the corpse comes back to life. Though I just, it's brilliantly looking. Yeah. And, and also going back to Pit and the Pendulum, the ending of this yep, yep. is powerful. And, mm-hmm. To Brian's point, that couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> but like when he's in the effigy, right? And then you hear him like just his thoughts, right? Like you can't talk or whatever. But like it's like, good. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> I'm glad you're 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 feeling that like as you're about to get burnt to a crisp, you know. I like the um the, the that Margarita shows the point of view from inside, mm-hmm. um, which of course Bava had done, uh, you know, at, at, with Black Sunday with the old Mask of Satan thing. We see it, mm-hmm. you know, from both sides, but also anticipates uh, one of my favorite British horror films of the period, uh, The Skull, where mm-hmm. there's those wonderful oh, yeah. skull point of view shots. And it also anticipates uh, a very famous uh, British horror film, the seventies, The Wicker Man, Yep. yep. Uh, the yep. ending of this film. Although to be fair, that book was kind of based without credit on a book called Ritual. Right. Um, it's the base, same basic story, but they didn't credit it. Well, somebody, to, to the point about Kurt, I mean, somebody named Kurt did Ernesto Gastaldi dirty because between this and the whip in the body where Christopher <laughs> Lee plays another sadist uh, named Kurt, uh, you know, obviously he, he has an issue with somebody named Kurt in his, his background. The music is Carlo Rustichelli, who also da, did the scores for Whip in the Body oh. and uh, Blood and Black Lace. You could hear that Blood and Black Lace in this, mm-hmm. in, in this, in this movie. There's some themes that are kind of recycled, reorchestrated, and so forth between those films. You know, there's there's a definite kind of similarity. Um, but as I mentioned, it's uh, written by Gastaldi, who is one of the big uh, Italian screenwriters, but also uh, co-wrote it with Tonino Valeri, who had hoped to make this his directorial debut uh, Valeri later went on to direct westerns like uh, Day of Anger and uh, My Name is Nobody, mm. produced by Sergio Leone, and he and Gastaldi were great friends. Obviously, that didn't work out. Uh, they got Margariti to do it instead because uh, they didn't want to take a chance on a you know neophyte director, so Margariti had already done these other two gothics, and he was a safe pair of hands and does a very good job with it, although he didn't like the script very much. I have to say, uh, in, in later interviews, he indicated he thought the movie was pretty hobbled by a poor script, so yeah, there you go. You can't please everybody. <laughs> I do like it when, you know, Barbara Steele rolls in, and you're just waiting for somebody to recognize her. Including she's, her sister. <laughs> yeah, she, I was like, I'm like, she's just kind of acting like she has amnesia, and you're like, is this really another character? I don't see how it could be. But that's kind of the fun of waiting for the reveal because you like yeah. there has to be some connection, and you know, turns out to be a pretty good one. Well, there's another significant thing that's worth mentioning too is the name Karnstein that's used in this right, film, right? Uh, which you know, Valeri and Gastaldi had just written an adaptation of Carmilla called Terror in the Crypt with Christopher Lee. Uh, which Margariti was supposed to direct. So there you go. Uh, waste not, want not. So obviously they decided to recycle that name, and and that in and of itself gives you a sense there's something probably a little bit witchy going on here or whatever. Um, you know, maybe expect some vampire action this time around, but we don't get vampires this time. And if they'd only named him Kurt Karnstein. Kurt Karnstein. Maybe that was too much alliteration for me. Yeah, that's too far. It's <laughs> too much. As you but it's, out, it's kind of like Gestalt's Jallo scripts in a sense. You know, again, mm-hmm. we're, we're talking about Pit and the Pendulum. Pit and the Pendulum is definitely a big model because that was a huge hit. Uh, Gestalt said many times that uh, the weapon of body came about because uh, the producers said, write something like Pit and the Pendulum. Hmm. Uh, the same thing here. But it also, Pit and the Pendulum takes a lot of inspiration from Diabolique. 
the Clouseau film, mm. uh, not Inspector Clouseau, but uh, Henri Georges <laughs> Clouseau uh, from the mid fifties, which uh, Jimmy Sangster recycled over and over again at Hammer for a series of thrillers. But uh, Gastaldi did too. Uh, so sweet, so perverse. They also ripped that off of me. Um, uh, you know, and many other kind You're of. You're a victim, sexy... Troy. I'm you a know? total victim. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry for you. <laughs> Appropriately <laughs> enough, Paranoia was another one. You know, uh, Orgasmo. Yeah, it was all these kind of films that were uh, indebted to Diabolique, and many of them were written by Gastaldi. So yeah, this is kind of a horror variation on that plot. And and Brian. And John, we've we've talked about Gastaldi several times on mm. the uh, Kicking the Seat Academia Giallo. What are your thoughts on you know his contributions here? Like John said, actually, like you could pick apart this entire script, like you know here and there or whatever. But I, I enjoy the um, the setup of it. I enjoy the um, the spirit coming back to exact vengeance. Yes, there's a lot of like loopholes in this in this movie, but. Um, I did, I like the writing in it um, more so like the just the dialogue in this movie. Um, there's a lot of just like cool references to um, just the gothicness. There's a line in, in this film um, during his like his re repenting uh, for what he did towards the end. Like it, th there's stuff like that that's in this movie that isn't in a lot of other movies. Like I, I like that they were able to put that little detail of him recounting what he's done in his past and and why he's gotten here you know like being burnt at the stake and it's it's sort of like that that nice little balance of like we begin the movie with a burning and then we end the movie with a burning so i like that stuff in this movie um you know script be damned or whatever like um i i enjoy a lot of that stuff even in jalo in jalo films like where like something kind of almost comes out of left field but it kind of connects nicely with other things you know it's almost like you're writing in order to put this particular set piece in the movie yes um but you're also giving it some like some substance to it or whatever so it doesn't it yes it feels a little like random but at the same time it fits perfectly like yeah. in everything else you know and so, that's but, and i mean and that's what i like about gastaldi's giallo yeah. scripts is that there's so much little stuff in there that it keeps it interesting so it's kind of like what hitchcock used to say you know like that it's a way homer where you think about it on the way home, you know, right, or the three right. o'clock in the morning where you're like, Hey, wait a minute, that doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> but in the moment you are absolutely just caught up in the, the story and mm -hmm. the tons of little details that are rolling in. And I feel like he definitely does that here. Like we just, every time we start to go, Hey, wait a minute, he throws something new in to keep our interest. And even with the whole, like he's, he's thinking that, uh, that she's dead, right? Like his right. wife. But like there's like sightings throughout the entire castle and it's like, so it's almost like he's right. playing with our viewpoint as yep. well as uh, Kurt's viewpoint. And it's like that nice little mystery of like, oh, like, well, what's, is it in his head? Are they plotting against him? Like what's going on? You know, um, I just love that stuff. Those little tiny details that don't necessarily have to be there. But it, it, for me, that's what sets this apart from um, Castle of Blood is like those little nuances that just like, you know, it invites you to just eat more of this story, you know. I What I really liked that's very in the background of this is the threat of the church. Mm, yeah. Because you have this, uh, the count, I mean, there's this, you know, aristocratic people, but, ooh, don't, don't watch out. The, that guy's over there. Don't, don't say anything in front of him. And then the fact that the, they had to, cut, they were cutting the hair off the villagers to cover up the effigy, which I'm like, okay, that's really bizarre, mm -hmm. but a very unique idea to create this, this dummy. And that by burning that, that's going to burn the sins and right. of the, and you're like, okay, whoever came up with that, that's a really cool idea. Mm -hmm. But I also, like I said, I, I like the fact that the, the church was kind of a, a threat there in the background, even now, not necessarily a bad threat, but, to the way these regals, the count and stuff, well, the way they were getting away right? with shit. Yeah, exactly. And I thought that was really a really nice touch. I saw this online recently. There was some talk about Psycho. And, you know, somebody came in and said, you know, as much as I love that movie, there's a bit at the end. It just doesn't make any sense the way the, 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 the body in the chair, the way it turns around. That wouldn't happen. 
And I thought, so what? <laughs> is that the only thing that doesn't make sense in that movie? When you really think about it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And it's so iconic, right? Like It's a, it's that, a that great shot. moment. It justifies yeah. itself. Is it really right. necessary and tenebrae for the movie to stop dead for two minutes as the camera trails all over the roof? But that's the whole reason why that movie exists mm. is because he wanted to do that shot. That's why um, I love you, Troy. Just an FYI. Oh, that's, well, I, that's very kind of you to say so. I don't know how popular that point of view is, but uh, no, it's true. I don't true. care, but you said it, and that's why. I love you, so. Or, or Deep Red. You know, I mean, a movie that's otherwise it's actually very well plotted, and it does mm -hmm. hold together very well. But there's the dummy. How the hell does that happen? It doesn't right. matter. It's a right. great scene. It's a right. great scene, and that's what matters. Margarita at this time is steeped into this gothic world. I mean, it's important to note that prior to this, uh, mostly he's doing peplums in science fiction, and that's the big thing he does throughout most right. of the 60s is all those uh, science fiction movies, um, uh, some of which feature a very young Franco Nero. He, he shot really four of those in yeah. 1964. Yeah, he was very prolific, very busy. You know, like Bava, he was a um, special effects artist in addition to being a director. So he's working on a lot of other films, uh, doing miniatures. Bava's big thing was like, you know, mat shots and and sort of magic tricks within the camera. Margarita's thing was miniatures. You watch a Margarita film, you know you're going to get a scene with miniatures. Um, there's, a, there's a movie he did in the 80s called uh, Ark of the Sun God, uh, where there's this incredible car chase sequence that's done with with miniatures and you're just like oh my god this is so wonderful i mean it's so stupid but it's so wonderful god bless you for doing it um for so putting all that work in <laughs> all that work in is like this 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 wouldn't fool anybody but you know what it's, i love it i love it just the same but after this he doesn't really do much within the gothic uh, he switches uh gears by the late 60s he's doing a couple of jally here and there as you mentioned before westerns and so forth uh, probably wasn't helped by the fact that this movie, too, was not a big success when it came out. So, you know, that obviously there wasn't a great deal of incentive for him to keep coming back and doing more. Well, I, and I do hope that, you know, shows like this help uh, raise his banner just a little higher because I think he is he is a, a pillar of the Italian horror industry. I really uh, I've enjoyed pretty much everything I've seen of his uh, because it comes from a genuine place of creativity, as you said, with the miniatures, like he's looking to create something that's really enjoyable for an audience. He's, he's very much a populist filmmaker where he's looking to entertain, not necessarily to make great art, but just to get something that uh, people will enjoy. Yeah. His son kind of confirmed that. I, th I think even in that documentary you were talking about before Aaron, you know, the outsider where, he he wasn't really looking to make grand statements or anything like that. He was just making entertaining films. I mean, it's possible to do both. And I think that a lot of these directors very often did have kind of themes and ideas that they played with. And it's there in Bava's films. It's there in Argento's films. It's in Fulci's films and so forth. But, you know, Margariti really, he liked action, I think, more than the, those guys. He really... That's what he really enjoyed doing, which I think is why for a long time he was kind of dismissive towards Castle of Blood because mm. it's not so much action. Sure. Uh, you know, whereas he he tended to specialize in movies that had a lot of uh, a lot of action going on. So he was closer to somebody like an Umberto Lenzi in that sense. Any final thoughts on uh, Margriti, Steele, and our two features for tonight? They're must sees. Yeah, no, no, no matter like if if you're watching this and you hear my thoughts about Castle of Blood, like just don't listen to me. I'm kind of a <laughs> idiot or whatever but um that's not um, true um, brian we love you too <laughs> umberto raja was also in amok i don't know if troy mentioned that but he was in amok he's in, amok, he also, he's in cat of nine tales um, he's yeah. also in uh the night evelyn came out of her grave night evelyn came out of the grave cat of um, nine tales the movie right behind you he's in that mm -hmm. yes yeah. yes my signed uh this is, I don't know if you remember, but when when I met Argento and you you asked me to have him sign your, uh, mm -hmm. you know that, that's the one that I got signed. That, that there you go. Fateful day, <laughs> whatever. Um, Grimalda, the the lovely lady that plays her, her name's Laura Nucci, mm. and she was in Bloodstained Butterfly. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of Jalo connection in this film, not to mention Seven Deaths and a Cat's Eye, which I hope we cover over at Academia Jalo. Um, there you go. Can, convince Ian to kind of squeeze in uh, Margareti, uh, you know, Well, considering we haven't done a Margarita yet, we should absolutely make that happen. Yes. 
Well, he only did two Jally, and I think it's the best of the two. So I would I would say that's a good pick. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, this has been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed having you all on and looking forward to next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And until next time, keep searching, keep exploring, and keep sharing the scare.